Today, more than ever, our planet is reeling from a range of environmental threats. Severe droughts have dried up great swaths of land. But in the heart of central Mexico, researchers are using a revolutionary new science, nanotechnology, to try to make the arsenic-laced groundwater safe enough to drink. Elsewhere around the globe, mass industrialization has left a trail of hazardous sites and contaminated soils. But in Canada, engineers are using nanoscience to clean up the deadly toxins. Within uh, minutes, there will be a significant drop in the contaminant levels in, in, the, in this area. The development of the science is rooted in our ever-increasing ability to manipulate the tiniest of particles, to explore the once unknown and unseen world of nano. I will be breathing in nanoparticles as I stand here. When I go back in the car, our roads are full of nanoparticles from exhaust. What is new is the deliberate engineering of these very, very small particles to have enhanced or even novel properties and the uncertainties that that introduces in terms of the potential risks to the environment and health. In this episode of the Nano Revolution, we explore pioneering environmental research and we jump into the future to dramatize how the technology might impact our lives. We have always counted on new technologies to help us shape our world. Now, researchers are crossing another technological frontier. In the nano dimension, they're learning to manipulate the most intimate mechanics of life. And they promise us more control of our bodies and of our environment. This three-part series explores a mysterious and unknown universe and the revolution it promises. Here inside this real-world snow globe on the grounds of the University of Toronto, there's a state-of-the-art lab where nanoparticles are being created. By mixing lead and sulfur at a prescribed ratio and temperature, hundreds of millions of nanoparticles are instantaneously and somewhat magically synthesized. But what is nanotechnology? How revolutionary is it? And is it going to change how we see the world around us? For starters, the nano world is an invisible one. If you look at the distance between the ridges of skin on your fingertips, nanoparticles are 80,000 times smaller. These particles can only be glimpsed by the most powerful electron microscopes. This is the world of nano, where it's possible to shape matter and alter its basic properties. Scientists like Professor Ted Sargent at the University of Toronto believe nanotech is the only way to go. He sees a future where nanoparticles applied to solar cells transform the way we capture energy. There's two aspects to these solar technologies that are incredibly exciting. And the first is just raw performance, performance to cost. The other thing about having a flexible solar cell or a paintable solar cell is that it just allows your imagination to go wild. Uh, imagine if you could uh, wear clothes that were solar energy harvesters and that would charge up the batteries of the mobile devices that you were carrying around. Imagine if you could create a sailboat whose sail uh, was also a solar energy harvester and could charge up the battery on your sailboat. The imaginative possibilities that emerge 
when you start to make low cost, flexible, and high efficiency solar cells simultaneously uh, are really limitless. Solar energy has already caught the imagination of both environmentalists and entrepreneurs. But what if its efficiency could be dramatically enhanced? Here on the edge of the vast Arabian desert, King Abdullah is building at a furious pace, creating an intellectual oasis among the dunes. Total price tag? $12 billion. This is the King Abdullah University of Science and Technology, or COUST for short. And look who's shown up here in Saudi Arabia. Professor Sargent and his solar nanotechnology have been beckoned to the land of easy oil. This country may be the largest exporter of oil in the world, but when you consider the amount of sunlight bombarding the desert floor every day, the potential for producing solar power here is simply astounding. Solar to us is very important. Uh, basically, uh, we had the challenge from the chairman of Cow's board telling us that uh, he wants Saudi Arabia in the future to export the same BTUs that we are exporting from fossil fuel in the form of solar energy. So I don't know how big that challenge is, but it's, it's really a tall order challenge. For Professor Sargent, the solution lies in designing a radically different solar collector using nanoparticles to maximize the sun's impact. It's a bit like when, uh, I guess it would have been in the 1950s, people wondered whether one could go to the moon. And uh, we, it became clear that there's no physical impediment. There's no laws of physics that would prevent that from happening, and it became a technology challenge. And it doesn't hurt that this technological challenge is fueled with a fantastic financial incentive. Energy today is a $9 trillion industry. I can't think of a bigger sector of the economy. I mean, it's absolutely huge. It's, it's something we almost don't notice because it's so much around us and we take it for granted. Does the eels show you like the elemental makeup of glycogen? Or? In the world of nano, Professor Sargent is a big deal. More than just a visiting professor, he's a rock star in the fiercely competitive world of nanoscience. And he's here to sing the praises of his unique and potentially hugely profitable approach to harnessing a seemingly limitless force. The sun's power reaching the Earth is really incredible. There's 10,000 times more solar power reaching the Earth every day than we use across all our energy habits. Uh, another way to put, put the same idea is that as much sun hits the Earth in an hour uh, as we consume in a year. The key that Professor Sargent's solar nanotechnology holds is its potential to unlock energy across the sun's entire light spectrum. One of the phenomena at, at the heart of nanotechnology is that we can shape matter. As a consequence, in my lab, when we make three different batches of nanoparticles, we can program them, each to be responsive to different slices of the sun's spectrum. The initial solar cell prototypes that Ted is working on look like this, a glass square coated with thin layers of nanoparticles embed the cells with tiny electrodes, bombard them with laser beams, and you can measure both the wavelength and current, and also, more importantly, gauge the cell's capacity to absorb the energy from a crucial and as yet largely untapped source, the sun's invisible infrared rays. And so it turns out that fully half of the sun's energy lies in the infrared frequencies and the other half in the visible. So, my research acknowledges that we need to capture all of that energy if we're going to make an efficient solar cell. Sargent is coy about his progress, but his experiments suggest that nano could revolutionize the design and manufacture of solar cells, and that the next generation of solar power will look very different from the installations of today. So the major differences in making quantum dot-based solar cells relative to existing approaches 
The first is that we actually do work with individual nanometer sized crystals and they're individually packaged. So each one is in, in a position such that we can just coat it, spray it, if you like, paint it onto a backing. Professor Sargent's City of the Future is one in which every building becomes its own power generating station. And then also by virtue of their lower cost, you won't hesitate to deploy them across the entire surface of the building. In fact, if they're, if they're cheap enough, if there's a little bit of power to be had from the sides of the building, uh, you might even put them there too. So what might this future look like? We've dramatized a potential world where nanotechnology has transformed how solar energy is harvested. I've been living in this city all my life. Now, over the years, I've seen changes I never would have believed. Take power. My grandson just assumes it comes from the sun. But it wasn't always like that. There used to be coal and oil. And who could forget all the trouble with nuclear? After that, energy saving came back. People bought all kinds of do-it-yourself solar stuff, like my mini panel. It's basic, but I'm still using it. Then came the Nanoflex fabric balloons. <laughs> At the beginning, they were kind of modest. My neighbor Sam was the first person I know to try one. Pushy guy. <laughs> Always wants to be first with everything. Yeah, did seem like a bright idea. But right away, there were tensions. And in no time at all, there was trouble. Sam, it's that damn balloon of yours. It keeps blocking the sun from my solar panels. Now there's no hot water. Hey, sunlight is first come, first serve. Go get yourself your own balloon. Hey, uh, uh, you can't hog our sunlight. Hey, hey, I can't help it if my balloon happens to be bigger than your panel. I'm gonna tear your damn balloon to pieces. Huh? Oh, shut up, you uh, solar thief. No, no, no. Sam's Nanoflex balloons were just the beginning. People started to think big. And do I mean big? Why stop at balloons and solar panels when you can have your very own nano solar reflector airship? Solar guzzlers, that's what they are. Swallowing up the sky. Nanoscience will not only revolutionize how we capture the sun's energy, new applications of nanotechnology promise to clean toxins out of our water supply. In these beautiful mountains in central Mexico, they've been living with a serious environmental health risk for years. We're in danger. We're in danger because uh, we uh, need water and the, on the only source we have is uh, poisoning with arsenic. Rafael Zorati has a big weight on his shoulders. He's the manager of the city's water utility. This is the city where I was born. And uh, right now, my responsibility is to make sure that everyone at their homes have water every time they need it. And in Guanajuato, everyone understands the importance of water to the town's very survival. Today, Zerati is overseeing a bucket brigade. To conserve water, he's asking citizens to use a bucket to catch the water that would otherwise go down the drain while their morning shower heats up. But the truth is, that while conservation helps ensure there's enough water for the future, the pressing issue of today 
is what's in the water. We are having water from 700 meters deep wells and uh, the concentrations on, of arsenic at that uh, uh, levels are very, very high. Although arsenic is strongly linked to cancer, more than 55 million people around the world still drink water that has naturally occurring concentrations of the toxin. Compounding this problem is the difficulty of removing arsenic from water. The water coming out from this uh, water treatment plant, it's uh, pretty clean, but uh, we still have a problem with the arsenic. And uh, we cannot face it with the available technology because it's too expensive for us. But there may finally be an affordable solution to Guanajuato's troubled waters. A team of scientists from Rice University has arrived and these three amigos aim to clean up this town and rid it of its arsenic problems once and for all. Professor Vicki Colvin and her grad students, Jesse Farrell and John Fortner, are here to conduct a series of experiments in which the arsenic will be zapped from the groundwater. Her secret weapon, nanoparticles. We can see those materials using our very latest instruments, so we can actually know a lot about how small they are because we can go down to those length scales. But more than that, they're strange. Materials on the nanoscale, they interact with material, with things around them very differently. And they don't behave at all like things that are just a little bit bigger. So that strangeness is really the value of nanomaterials. And when you find an application like we have here in Mexico, where that very strange chemistry can be coupled with a really important social need, that's when you have this opportunity to actually change people's lives. Nano's tower is a function of its vast surface area. As particles decrease in size, their surface area increases relative to their mass. A greater number of atoms are now available on the surface. These tiny nanoparticles initiate stronger and faster reactions with other atoms. Dr. Colvin and her team plan to make use of the nanoparticle surface area with this water filtration column. For this device to be of any use in the developing world, its design should be simple, with components that are both inexpensive and locally sourced. A layer of gravel, a layer of sand, and then the active ingredient nano-sized particles of ferrous oxide, also known as rust. Well, I think everybody knows what rust is. We're using a, a particular form of rust, and there's, we, nano rust is a good way to think about it, but it's special. It's special because it's really, really small. And so really what we're hoping to do is by using these nanomaterials that have just in a single small amount, tons and tons and tons and tons of surface area for the arsenic to stick to. It's kind of like an amazing sponge for arsenic. Good. Yeah. Well, I want to do it right. Yeah. Water everywhere is getting scarcer. It's getting harder, harder to clean it. You're having to dig deeper to find aquifers that are uh, not already been used by people. And in fact, arsenic becomes more of a problem, like in this community, as they have to turn to deeper and deeper wells. Those always have more and more arsenic. So it's, it's an existing problem, and it's certainly one that we anticipate growing, not just here, but in many, many other regions throughout the world. Hey guys. hey guys. Hey, Vicky. How's it going? It's going. Looks bueno. Looks like a column. <laughs> Muy bueno. It's, we're hoping to put 10,000 liters through that one pound of magnetite. Although this test column is relatively small, the Rice University researchers believe that if they can just get this one to work, they could scale up the process to eventually treat the city's entire water supply. Give me a good twist. Yeah, all right. You guys ready to clean some water? Yeah. All right, it's time to take it to the field. Took it up. All right, let's see what happens. That's pretty 
good. We're pumping the groundwater directly into the top of our column with arsenic in it. The nano-filtered water will be tested back at the lab to see if all the arsenic has been removed. Nanotechnology is this capability, this new, entirely new toolkit that people have available to them. And I think it's going to move into just about every arena, limited perhaps only by the creativity of people uh, and how they take these new ideas and new tools and solve some of the world's most hardest problems. Another environmental challenge we now face is cleaning up the chemical hangover that industry has left behind. It's a dirty job, but someone's got to do it. And today that someone is Professor Dennis O'Carroll from the University of Western Ontario. He and his students are here to try to clean up this old abandoned site using some brand new nanotechnology. Well, on the other side of the building here, they would have had a, a, a maintenance yard where they would have cleaned up tools and uh, uh, trucks um, with a trichloroethylene, which is a chlorinated solvent that's commonly used for degreasing. It would, it's also it's commonly used in dry cleaners. Historically, let's say 20, 30 years ago, when you were done with oils and these kind of liquids, you just pour them on the ground or pour them down a drain, uh, which, and they let it get into the subsurface. They didn't really understand uh, that, that these contaminants would persist for long periods of time, that they're extremely toxic. Professor O'Carroll is preparing to clean up the soil by mixing up a barrel full of nanoparticles that will then be injected into the contaminated ground. Uh, it's been injecting for about three and a half hours. Yeah, as long as the water is moving, it's not going to freeze. So we're watching for this to turn orange. Then it's going to be ready, uh, ready to dissolve. It's a complex and exacting procedure, made all the more difficult by a nasty mid-February Canadian deep freeze. What do you want to add? Turn up the red one. Yeah, it's frozen. We're it's frozen. These conditions do present uh, significant challenges with, with the freezing lines, the, 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 uh, the generator, the air compressors are harder to start. Having said that though, the contamination is moving over this way here. So the longer you wait, if you wait six months, it's gonna be that much further down, contaminated to more area. So we wanna get at it uh, as, as soon as possible. And the frigid weather isn't their only concern. Synthesizing these nanoparticles creates a dangerously explosive byproduct, hydrogen. So until we get it into the vessel, which is in an exclusion zone, we have to be very careful. That's why we have to, we have to kind of stay back. So this is the exciting time. We're going to inject the, the borohydride in, into the synthesis vessel. It's going to turn black. And that's, if it doesn't turn black, you're going to have some worried people here. But on cue, and without any fiery explosions, nanoparticles by the billions are created. It's not yellowish anymore or orangey. It's starting to of nanoparticles now. Four, 400, 420 mils in how many seconds? Eight. Eight seconds. That's crazy, eh? The nanoparticles are now ready to be pumped into the ground. So we're injecting the nanometals right in here. And what I'm doing is I'm, I'm keeping a close eye on the water level because we want to make sure it doesn't come up and over, uh, spill over the wellhead here. It's going to go in there and it's going to go towards this well here. Just stay there in case, <laughs> in case it comes up. <laughs> It'll be a, like a gusher. Once in the ground, the nanoparticles transfer electrons to the contaminant. A chlorine atom is stripped away from the trichloroethylene, effectively disarming it. So we're hoping that it's going to, we're going to have a smear zone around this entire zone to attack the contamination in this area. The nanometals that we're injecting today, we inject them in for two purposes. One, to attack the initial contamination in this zone, but then there's going to be some residual nanometals in this area. So as the water continues to flow through here that's contaminated, it'll flow through this, this residual nanoparticles and they'll, they'll be degraded. So uh, further on downstream, there, the, uh, the water will be cleaned and you can probably drink it. There are an estimated 400,000 contaminated brownfield sites scattered across North America. We are literally surrounded by them. 
But if you drive around, let's say, and you're at, at a four-way uh, stop and you see a couple of intersections that are uh, empty with a couple of wells sticking out, that's likely an old gas station that's contaminated where no one wants to go back in there and, uh, and buy up and, and redevelop the land because it is contaminated at significant cost. Not only are these nanoparticles good at busting up toxins, O'Carroll and his team are certain there's little risk of future contamination problems. Uh -huh. Well, these nanoparticles, they're, they're very reactive. So once we inject them into the ground, they don't last very long. They'll, they'll, react, they'll react with the contaminants in the ground, they'll react with the, the water, with air, uh, and, then, and then they'll essentially become rust. And they'll aggregate together, stick together, and then they'll settle out a solution and dissolve away. So there'll be no problem. But what about some of the other nanoparticles used today? After all, our past is littered with technological breakthroughs gone bad. The Nobel Prize was awarded for the development of DDT with the possibility of eradicating malaria. The use of asbestos as a fire retardant uh, had tremendous benefits, uh, but of course with significant impacts on human health. What we're trying to do with nanotechnology is avoid uh, those sort of disappointments to avoid those sort of environmental impacts. Here in the woods outside Duke University, Professor Mark Wisner is investigating the potential impacts of particular nanoparticles already in many consumer goods. These wooden crates are called mesocosms. Each crate contains water, soil, bacteria, plants, insects, even fish, and they're used to identify threats to a natural ecosystem. So uh, what we're doing here is testing nanomaterials in a very complex environment. Professor Wisner's grad students are spraying these mesocosms with silver nanoparticles, which are being used as antibacterials in all sorts of products. As we use these products, these things will go down the drain, end up in a wastewater treatment plant. The wastewater treatment plant will separate them into the clarified water and the, the, the sludge or the uh, the solids that come out of that process. The question is, what happens when the nanosilver accumulates in the treatment plant sludge and is then trucked out and spread over farmers' fields? One of the, the things that we're interested in looking at here is what happens when we do apply them to land? How long will they stay there? Where will they go? Uh, what kinds of uh, organisms will they impact along the way? Once a month, Professor Wisner's grad students return to sample water from these mesocosms to measure the nanoparticles that are still present. When you talk about a nanoparticle, it's all surface. Uh, when you get down to a particle that's something like five nanometers in diameter, uh, about half of the atoms are on the surface. Uh, nature will modify these surfaces just as much as people will modify the surface. So we can engineer the surface to death, but when we, when we put it out in nature, nature will begin to modify that surface. And we believe that those modifications change the very properties of the nanomaterials. Water samples from their mesocosms are brought back to the lab, where Professor Cole Matson analyzes their toxicity. So we're working with killifish larvae, and we're dosing them with one of our silver nanoparticles and trying to understand how different types of water affect the toxicity of those particles. Ultimately, the challenge is to understand what happens when engineered nanoparticles enter the environment, how they react, how they travel, whether they dissolve. Over the past several years, we've made a lot of progress in understanding how a particle might affect an individual species, fish, invertebrates, etc. But understanding how it may alter the entire ecosystem or microbial nutrient processing, etc., we're just at the cusp of, of that type of work. It's a challenge compounded by the incredible speed at which the nano applications are being pushed forward. We don't normally regulate most materials before they're released in commercial products in the United States. Um, and so Generally, we're left with a situation where we're trying to understand whether products that are already out on the market might pose a, a hazard to either wildlife or humans specifically. So 
so you know we have to work very fast to try to understand these questions as quickly as we can. Um, you know, the last thing anyone wants is 30 years from now figuring out that there was a problem that we should have discovered earlier in the process. And so it is definitely a race. You know what? Some things are never quite what they seem. This park, for instance. I'm gonna go play. See you later. <laughs> I live nearby and come here every day when my grandson's around. He'd play here all day if he could. Now, this park was a wasteland when I first bought my little apartment. That was the only reason I could afford the place. Nobody wanted to live on the edge of a dead zone. It was all fenced up and no one could go near it. But I was lucky. It was chosen for the latest nano remediation soon after I moved in. The whole area was off limits for years. No one knew exactly what they were up to, but in the end, it was amazing. Magical to see a dark, derelict space come alive again. A rundown wasteland transformed into a beautiful park. It's a joy to see my grandson play here with his friends and think back on what it used to be like. But lately I'm not so sure. Protective tents went up again. And the inspectors were back, looking for something. I don't know what. Then the anti-nano troublemakers started. Looks like fear-mongering to me, but fear can be catching. I don't know what to think, as I say. These days, nothing's quite what it seems. That kind of uncertainty is just what the scientists at Duke University are trying to avoid. But the difficulty facing them is that they are unsure of the questions that must be asked, let alone the answers. The sources of uncertainty in this area are numerous. We don't know what nanomaterials will be made. We don't know how they will be used. We don't know how many will be used. They, we don't know where they will go. We don't know who they'll impact. Um, there are a great number of unknowns. Some of the unknowns are unknown. Some of the unknowns are known. So what do we know and what do we don't know and what have we not yet imagined? As well as cleaning up our water and soil, nanoparticles may also be able to clean up our air. It's spring in the beautiful and historic city of Edinburgh, Scotland. The sun is out and the trees are in bloom. It's one of those perfect days. But things are not nearly as perfect as they seem. There's something in the air, nanoparticles, We've grown somewhat accustomed to the bad air in our cities, but scientists now know that the air contains nanoparticles, and they're dangerous. On his daily commute to the Royal Infirmary, Dr. David Newby, a cardiac surgeon, tries to avoid streets with congested traffic. We see a lot of patients come into our coronary care unit with acute heart attacks, severe heart attacks, life-threatening heart attacks. And actually, if you look at what they're doing in the hours before they come in to have their heart attack, they're two to three times more likely to be in traffic. Case in point, just a few hours ago, this patient was rushed to the hospital suffering from a heart attack. What's she doing when, when she got um, a chest pain? That was a good question, actually. They were basically driving home and um, caught in traffic, and uh, yeah, she suddenly started getting some chest pain. Yeah. Dr. Yubi's research is now linking heart attacks with heavy traffic. And it's not the frustration of sitting in traffic that's to blame. It's the clouds of nanoparticles suspended within diesel exhaust. What we now understand is that this very small particles that are in the diesel exhaust of traffic, these nanoparticles, we call them combustion-derived nanoparticles because it's when the engine burns them, 
So when people breathe in these combustion-derived nanoparticulates in the air, they can influence the lung, cause inflammation in the lung, and that then causes a cascade of effects that can affect the heart and trigger the heart attack. We also believe that these nanoparticles are so small that they can actually fly across the blood vessel wall because in the lungs, the blood vessel wall is incredibly thin. So we think these nanoparticles, when they're in the bloodstream, can actually trigger these plaques, this fatty deposit in the artery, to burst open, and that can cause a heart attack to occur. To strengthen this theory of his, Dr. Newby has designed a simple field experiment. Morning, Roger. Hey. Hi, my name's Dr. Barnes. I'm one of the researchers involved in the study. Just before we take you out on the walk, we need to put an ECG machine onto you and a, a blood pressure cuff just to measure your blood pressure. Are you feeling okay? Yeah, a bit Frankenstein like with all these. Sure, okay. you're not the first to say that. With the heart monitor and blood pressure cuffs in place, the nano detectives hit the streets to track the invisible plumes of nanoparticles and monitor how the test subject reacts as they enter his body. And so I think when this bus goes past, it'll be interesting to see what count we get up to. We're about 30,000 at the moment. Yeah, and you can oh, see wow, it's jumped yeah. up quite a bit there. Yeah, so wow. it jumped up to about 48,000. Are you feeling okay, monitor? Yeah, yeah, no, it's fine. Now, if you're sitting in traffic, and you think you're safe from the exhaust-borne nanoparticles because your windows are sealed up tight, guess again. Actually, inside a car, the pollution levels are much, much higher than outside the car. They're about four or five times higher inside a car. So there are four or five times as nanoparticulates circulating. So if the air in our congested cities is so bad for us, what can we do to get rid of these dangerous nanoparticles? The answer may be found here, a few hundred kilometers away, in Oxford, England. That's the famous Radcliffe Observatory over there. Peeble College, we're going past now. Somerville College, where Margaret Thatcher was. One of our favorite pubs. It's a nice tour, isn't it? <laughs> it's a great tour. <laughs> Peter Dobson, a professor here at Oxford University, is not only a terrific tour guide, he's also one of the top nanoscientists in the world, and he plans to fight those deadly exhaust-borne nanoparticles with, well, some nanoparticles of his own. It's shaping up to be a nano-a-nano -nano battle. And thanks to today's imaging technology, Professor Dobson has a ringside seat. The thinking about nanotechnology for me, and I guess many of my colleagues, is a 24-hour-a-day exercise. We can never get it out of our minds. We're thinking all the time about potential applications of the material we're working with, or if we're seeing problems, we're asking how can nanotechnology solve those problems? What new property can we uh, endow in a particle which will solve the problem we're seeing? Professor Dobson believes the road to cleaning nanoparticles out of the air in the world's major cities begins right here at the bus depot in the outskirts of Oxford. The fuel on this bus has got cerium oxide particles suspended in the diesel fuel. And the idea started because of a chance meeting in a pub between uh, someone who had this vision of using cerium oxide to improve uh, diesel engines and a former student of mine. And between them, they found a way to make cerium oxide nanoparticles that could be added to diesel fuel and eliminate the harmful nanoparticles in the exhaust. Clean emission, no soot coming out of the tailpipe, and uh, uh, we see this as a, a radical way of improving all internal combustion engines and possibly other combustion as well. This drum, containing hundreds of trillions of cerium oxide nanoparticles, is connected directly to the diesel refueling tanks. Inside the engine cylinders, cerium oxide works as a potent catalyst, giving up oxygen 
that allows the fuel to burn more efficiently. If you envisage breaking the cerium oxide down from big lumps, down into lots of tiny little nanoparticles, you end up with a very high surface area. And it's that surface area which drives the catalysis and makes it so effective as a diesel fuel additive. This is a good example of how a nanomaterial can help clean up the planet. But for the environment as a whole, what is the likely impact of nanotechnologies? We're learning more about the environment that exists, but we're also beginning to understand how we can adapt nanotechnology to clean up some of the pretty dreadful contaminants we've introduced there already. I'm one of the optimists. I think that nanotechnology is going to play a much bigger role in improving the environment than damaging it. Dr. Richard Owen, who holds the chair in environmental risk assessment at the University of Westminster, cautiously tours a derelict industrial site on the outskirts of London. Dr. Owen also sees the potential for engineered particles to dramatically change our world. But will it be for the better? We're beginning to understand more about how nanoparticles behave in the environment. But they're very complex, that behavior is complex. Technology and innovation, like nanotechnologies, doesn't happen in a vacuum. It happens because it interacts with us as human beings. And the key thing is that we understand that, that we recognize that, that we all have our faults, and that technologies can sometimes go wrong. They needn't go wrong if we develop them responsibly. And that's the sheer challenge for us now, with this probably the most exciting technology of the 21st century. But Dr. Owen believes that there are no quick answers when it comes to the safety of nanotechnology. There have been no reported um, effects in the environment. No, no real impacts have been observed. And in fact, we haven't really detected many of these man manufactured nanoparticles in the environment themselves. So from my own personal view, it's not that we've shown that they're harmful, or that they have pose a risk, it's, it's just that we don't know. Some of the most recent calculations have been that just the safety testing for those nanoparticles that are manufactured in, in the US alone, those ones that are on the market now, could be between 30 and 50 years and up to a billion dollars to complete. But it's hard to generalize about how long it's going to take for us to figure out whether nanomaterials pose a risk to the environment and health but it's going to take decades, guaranteed. It'll be decades before we fully understand, just for the ones that are out there now, and be able to make decisions on that basis. Like all technology revolutions, nanoscience now has its own momentum. Back in Ontario, Professor O'Carroll's team are proud to be part of it. Hey Magda, what's your ORP? 50. 50? Well, it should be coming any time now. It should come right through. We haven't seen it yet, and I haven't seen it come through here, but it'll be there very soon. It's going to turn black, I'd say, in the next 40 minutes. Um, so we, that it indicates that we've got good smearing of this zone uh, for the remediation of the site. As far as Professor O'Carroll is concerned, nanoparticles are the future for cleaning up contaminated sites like this. We're anticipating a widespread acceptance of this technology because we're able to inject the nanoparticles where the contaminants are. Um, a lot of other remediation technologies, you have to dig up an entire site, which is uh, very costly. Uh, you, then you have to do something with the contaminated soil. So here, this is an institute technique right in the ground. We can inject them where they can degrade. We don't have to disrupt the whole site. In Guanajuato, Mexico, the city is gearing up for one of its biggest events of the year, the Festival of Flowers. While most of the city has come out to enjoy the party, Jesse Farrell, the nanotech researcher from Rice University, is getting down to business. It's time to test the water samples to see if the column of nano rust sucked out all the arsenic from the contaminated groundwater. In this test, um, the arsenic in the water 
um, is converted into arsine gas, and that gas reacts with the test strips on the top of these vials. And so these test strips change color depending on the amount of concentration in the water. So it's kind of like a pH test strip on steroids. How's it going? Oh, hey, um, pretty good. Okay. I just uh, just got done with the reaction period uh -huh. for the arsenic, uh -huh. so I'm just checking out our results. Oh, great, great. For Professor Vicky Colvin and Rafael Zarati, the local water manager, this is the moment they've been waiting for. Has the nano rust removed the arsenic from the city's drinking water? That's the before. That's the before, <laughs> yeah. We do the after. After our nano magnetite. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah. yeah, it's all gone. Yeah, great. Zero. Uh -huh. Yeah, this is right. zero. Yes. Um, yeah. So right now, there is no arsenic coming out of the column. It's, it's being completely removed fabulous. by the nanomagnetite. It's uh, called an experiment, uh, but so, fabulous. It's yeah. a really, really good outcome. So now we just have to right. keep watching yeah, it. I think that at this moment in time, we are poised. This is our technology developed. This will be our generation's contribution to the world to take it up that next step. And so, yes, I think my kids are going to live a better life because of the kinds of nanotechnology that we have, where we can put it in and solve the problems that all of us are facing. Nanotechnology is already transforming the world of science and engineering. The big question now is, how is this revolution going to shape the world in which we live? And how do we best manage the inherent risks? One of the elements of our work is trying to imagine, if you had a nanoparticle in front of you, what would it look like if it were dangerous? Would it be blue? Would it be long? Uh, what would be the characteristics of a dangerous nanomaterial? We don't even know that yet. I would be surprised if there wouldn't be some unintended consequence that's going to get past our experimental uh, uh, network. Uh, we can't anticipate everything, but we can uh, reduce uh, the uncertainty and we can reduce the impact. Well, the people that lived and worked in this building behind me have long gone, but they lived in a very different society 80 years ago, only 80 years ago than the one that we live in now. And that society has been shaped by successive waves of technology and innovation, nuclear technology, molecular biology, information technology, and now nanotechnology. And my grandchildren will live in a very different world again, shaped again by innovation and technology. And as human beings, that's what makes us, our creativity and our appetite to move on and be innovative. But we also know that we have to be responsible. With an exciting technology like nanotechnology, we don't want to be left with a legacy for our grandchildren to have to pick up. So a lot of the questions that we have about new technologies are not just technical risk questions, they're philosophical questions. What kind of technology do we want? Is it safe? Should people have a say in shaping technology? Do, do we live better lives? Does it have unintended consequences? Does it create inequalities? We accept these technologies, we buy these goods, we move on. What we should probably do is be a little bit more reflexive, think a little bit more about those technologies and about the world in which they are deployed and how we live with those technologies in that world.